Welcome back, my undead hunters, to the last of the top Dark Souls 2, 3, and Bloodborne boss ratings. We've come a long way since number 60, but now it's time to cross every remaining boss from the list in this final ranking video. We've seen a lot of terrible and amazing bosses so far, but I can say without a doubt that these are my 15 favorite bosses from software has ever produced. Of course, I'd like to remind everyone that I haven't played Dark Souls 1 or Demon's Souls, so no, those bosses won't be on this list. Maybe one of these days, but not this one. So instead, I'll treat you to what I've come to know as my favorites in this final video. This time around, if you missed the previous videos, don't worry. I'll be posting the full 60 listings in a word crawl at the end of this video. So if you're lazy like me, feel free to skip the entirety of this video if you just want to see the meat. Otherwise, fasten your seatbelts as we kick things off with number 15. Despite Dark Souls 2 having by far and away the worst bosses of any of these games, I'm happy to still find 5 lucky bosses made it to the top 15, and Tigress of Gaul from Gladiator is first on this list. So the Looking Glass Knight, or as some people call him, the Mirror Knight, is just a beautiful encounter. The arena is top quality based solely on the environment. During your battle with the Looking Glass Knight, a raging lightning storm is going on and the boss even taps into the storm during the fight. That may not sound that cool to the average gamer, but trust me, this guy makes it work better than just about any other boss that's come before him and after. During the fight, he also has an odd added gimmick of summoning an NPC or potentially an online player, and the fight would be better without this little tidbit, but it's not so bad that it keeps this epic guardian out of the top 15. These guys catch a lot of heat for being Smo and Ornstein ripoffs, but way lamer. If that's the case, ONS must be pretty damn amazing because I actually love this fight. The constant danger where you're forced to pick and choose between attacks on this boss makes for a thrilling fight. Not to mention the unique appearances of both the Watcher and Defender, they're really quite cool. I wish there was more lore to look into these guys, but sadly, like the looking class before them, they're basically guardian bosses in the end. While this is a shame, it really doesn't detract from the boss fight that I really love. In fact, these guys, if they were dropped in the Dark Souls 3 fast-paced combat engine, they would actually be quite a bit higher up on this list. The Bloodborne Cthulhu equivalent and the root of all Yarnum's problems. The blood of this creature has caused more trouble than anything else in Bloodborne, save for maybe the Moon Presence, if it is the mastermind the theories claim it to be. But unlike the Moon Presence, Sabrinas is a constant and dangerous threat. Unlike most bosses, you actually have to engage her in order for the fight to begin, marking you as the dick in this situation. But Sabrinas is too good of an opportunity to pass up. Seriously, the only reason I ever go to the Upper Cathedral is to face her. The mystery behind her role, the crazed praise behind the church's motives, and the skill required to take down this great one makes her my favorite of the in-game bosses of Bloodborne. Only three Dark Souls 2 bosses remain on this list, and the Fume Knight is the first of them. He is possibly the most difficult challenge in all of Dark Souls 2, tying with or maybe just losing out to two or three others. Difficulty aside, this aggressive as hell knight is also key to some great, albeit unbelievable, lore. I don't think anyone who's ever played this game believes for a second that the Fume Knight Reign would ever, ever lose a duel with Velstat. It just doesn't seem possible. Still, that nonsense aside, the design of this boss is great in all aspects. He's overly aggressive, has a large array of moves, contains two very different boss phases, he looks badass as hell, and is one of the toughest, but still fair boss fights Dark Souls 2 has to offer, earning him his spot as number 12 on this list. Now even though I'm placing the Abyss Watchers at number 11, I have to admit they seem a bit overhyped in the Dark Souls community right now. 
Yes, I'll admit virtually everything about this boss is perfect, but... Ah, fuck it. I don't want to be a stickler. These guys are awesome. They're fast, unique, and cool as hell. Although not my favorite Lord of Cinder, the Abyss Watchers is my second favorite gang fight on this entire list, and if you fought them, you know why they're so great. The music is one of the all-time best. Their lore mirrors the great Artorias. Their fast-paced difficulty is tough even by Dark Souls 3 standards, and despite their ridiculous helmets, they have one of the coolest outfits in Dark Souls 3. My one problem is that they seem to have a small health pool, but I can let that slide considering how much damage they do, and that you can fight them early on in the game. Regardless, the Abyss Watchers are the epitome of great Dark Souls 3 bosses. The final boss of Dark Souls 3, and in my opinion, come to Game Plus, is by far and away the hardest. Trust me, the only other boss that compares as you start reaching New Game Plus 5 and higher is the next boss on this list. In fact, the only reason Soul of Cinder isn't higher is because he eventually starts becoming unfair in his boss battles as he absorbs way too much damage while dealing out almost twice as much. And even so, you'll still find him at number 10 on this list for his undeniable greatness. First off, his design is unmatched by any other boss in Dark Souls 3. He is essentially you, the characters whom have linked the fire before you, and ironically, they're far more dangerous than the Phase 2. But in Phase 2, you're treated to a remix or updated version of Gwyn's beautiful Dark Souls 1 boss theme, and the Soul of Cinder also reflects the former god himself in the way he fights you. This is an amazing callback even to players like me who haven't played Dark Souls 1, and only know of him through lore and videos. But even without the nostalgia, all that aside, the Soul Ascender is great enough to crack the top 10. The second hardest boss in Dark Souls 3. Pontiff Sullivan is the most relentless boss in the game alongside, albeit only second to, the champion Gunder. Difficulty aside, he is another prime example of a boss that has it all. He has a gorgeously designed arena, a beautiful musical score, and has an awesome lore to back it all up. Pontus Sullivan has dipped his feet into almost all the lore stories surrounding your adventure through Dark Souls 3, and when you at last face the crazed Pontiff, you soon learn why it would be unwise to challenge this cleric. As you pass through the fog gate, you're treated to his gorgeous arena with him standing still in the distance. As you approach him, his swords ignite like lightsabers and he too begins to approach you in turn. From there on, you are in for one of the wildest rides any of these games has to offer, and it comes in the form of Pontiff Sullivan, one of the best bosses Dark Souls 3 has to offer. Speaking of great Dark Souls 3 bosses, there's the Lothric Princes. Prince Lorien and Lothric, are not far behind the Soul of Cinder in design. This is a gang fight without actually being a gang fight, if that makes any sense, and the creators have deployed this boss perfectly. The music, the lore, the fight to the death, it's all rolled up perfectly in this fight. Lorian will have you dancing around the map to escape his vicious swings, and that alone is a blast. In Phase 2, when Lothric arrives, he serves to further keep you on your toes, as he only expands Lorian's arsenal of attacks. When you roll this entire fight together, it is possibly the best thrill ride in the entire game, if not the series, and while he's only my third favorite boss in Dark Souls 3, he's still undoubtedly one of the greatest and most fun bosses ever. If we weren't already, we've arrived into flawless territory. So that's how I'll describe Lady Maria. She's flawless. Keeping with Old Hunter's DLC trend of relentless bosses, Lady Maria is the best hunter duel in the game, eclipsing Garmin in my opinion without difficulty. Even if I toss her great lore aside, I'd still rank her here because this battle encapsulates the best of Bloodborne's hunter duels, and then some. Lady Maria is a three-stage boss fight that at first you might not find too threatening. You'll face her 
trade damage, but soon enough you'll find yourselves into stage 2 where things change for the better, as she adds blood trails to her attacks, extending her range and damage immensely. In stage 3, things change for the best when she tacks on fire trails to her blood trail attacks, further extending her damage and lethality. When you enter stage 3, this dance of death becomes the most memorable one-on-one -on -one duel in all of Bloodborne. This is considered Dark Souls 3's crowning boss, the Nameless King. And it's hard to disagree, but for me, there's just one other Dark Souls 3 boss I prefer a bit more. Still, the Nameless King is one of the best bosses ever made. Right from the get-go, you're treated to an amazing cloud arena upon exiting the Fog Gate, and you're also treated to an entry of the King of Storms. Riding atop his Storm Drake, yes, Storm Drake, not Dragon, I stick by what I said when I told you Sin was the only good Dragon boss. The Nameless King becomes an epic encounter against both him and his old friend. Upon dethroning the King from his Drake, you must face him after he absorbs the Drake, similarly to ONS when they absorb the other. Here is where the true fight begins, and praise the sun for this matchup. Even now when I can defeat the Nameless King without taking damage, I can honestly say this fight just blows me away with how incredible it's executed. But no matter how perfect this fight is, there are still five more that are even better. Welcome to the Old Hunters, holder of three of the best bosses of all time, all of which have made my top 15. Ludwig comes in at number 5, probably the hardest boss for me that From Software has ever produced. While I've been able to get good against him, it doesn't make this boss fight any more edgy every time we come face to face. From beginning to end, this boss is perfect. He has perhaps more moves in his arsenal than any other boss, and they are employed to counteract every single attack you have. He does this in both Phase 1 and 2. Phase 1, which is his beast form, shows him like an alpha male tiger in the wild. Sure, he'll stop for a moment every once in a while to stare you down, but when he attacks, he is vicious and unforgivably relentless. And although Bloodborne is designed for greedy players to remain greedy, Ludwig will punish the greedy more than any other boss in the game. Save for Lawrence, maybe. In Phase 2, he stops giving you a chance to rest and plunges you into a non-stop bloodbath, literally between you and his unforgiving Moonlight Greatsword. No matter who you are, this will be a fight for the ages. Next to the Fume Knight Rain, this is probably the hardest boss in all of Dark Souls 2. Although I admit, I'm very good at fighting him. When I first saw this fight take place as I was watching someone else, I was fascinated by the boss because he not only looked like one of the toughest bosses in any game I've ever played, but his design in both combat and appearance was astounding. When I first glanced at viewing Dark Lurker, you might see him as simple. For me, he reminded me of the Phantom of the Clock Tower from Kingdom Hearts, except much better designed. Until this day, I will admit that I still think he's one of the coolest hands-down bosses in both appearance and mechanics. Like most of my top 15 bosses, Dark Lurker has two phases. In phase 1, he's relatively slow and allows you to learn his moveset without too much punishment. But it's phase 2 where Dark Souls 2 reveals the greatest gank fight of all time when he splits into two Dark Lurkers. Something the people who made Pontiff Sullivan vainly tried to recreate. Now you must separate your eyesight and split your moves because a hit from any one of his attacks can be devastating, making this fight or flight encounter one of the greatest in gaming and certainly Dark Souls 2's best base game boss. We've arrived at Dark Souls 2's Boss King. Third on this list but number one in Dark Souls 2's heart. Surlon has my favorite lore in the entire Dark Souls series, save for the legendary Abysswalker himself. Surlon was a king amongst men that believed in personal honor and virtue above all else. He dedicated himself to the unworthy Iron King who abused the loyalty, causing Surlon to leave his service. When we the player fight Alon, it is as the old Iron King within a memory, which is dumb as hell because there's no damn way the Iron King could defeat him in any form. 
But that is besides the point. This fight is awesome! You've heard me say it before, but this is the undeniable truth when I say that Sir Alon is the best 1v1 man vs. man boss duel from software has ever put out. And if it was updated to the speed and play of Dark Souls 3, I think this could be number one on the list. But even so, this honorable duel against the most talented of warriors showcases Dark Souls 2's potential of great bosses. Which leaves me very confused considering that 80% of the in-game bosses of Dark Souls 2 suck horribly. Oh, who cares? Dark Lurker and Surlon are worth the grief. This one might not be as well received for being so high up on the list, but fuck you, I don't care. This is Dark Souls 3 crowning achievement, and boss queen in my opinion. I find the dance to be without a doubt, as far as my experiences go, to be the most iconic boss from software has ever produced. The feeling of true dread exists from the beginning of her opening cinematic, all the way through her second phase of dual wielding to her final breath on the dance floor. This boss is the epitome of amazing. Now, Dark Souls is not a scary game, nor does it try to be. And even scary games aren't that scary anymore, but for some reason the dancer is just mesmerizingly creepy. In phase one, when she's staring you down face to face, literally your faces are touching, and she's not making a move while this beautifully horrifying music is playing, it brings an undeniable sense of fear and loneliness to the player. And it's this first phase that might lull you into a false sense of security. Because in phase two, when she draws her second blade and begins to dance of death, you'll find that there's nothing secure in this fight. She will stop at nothing to finish you off, and the dance will not end until you finish her off. But you must engage in the dance if you want to defeat this iconic boss at number two. The Orphan of Koss. Drink in that name as I name him my number one spot. Long has he been considered the toughest boss ever made by From Software, and while he may not be my greatest challenge, he is without a doubt the most fun and exhilarating boss battle I've ever encountered. I knew the rumors before I got to him. I'd heard them from anywhere, and I always thought it was odd that this weird looking guy who looks like a plain hollow without clothes could be so tough. Well, he flat out is. Plus, he's my favorite lore story in Bloodborne, since it is basically the entirety of the old Hunter's DLC rolled into one little storyline for a final encounter. And the anger of this great one does not disappoint. In a battle with the most ferocious and unrelenting of bosses, he is incredible. In the first phase, the orphan, you're treated to a dangerous opponent, who, while not constantly on your ass, has a large number of moves that hit like placenta hammers. But, if you thought phase one was no picnic, get ready for the orphan to inject himself with a volatile mixture of crack meth, heroin, and good old fashioned cocaine as this motherless monster swoops and sprints across the beach to tear your hunter limb from limb. The orphan will do anything to escape this nightmare, and so will you, and that's why you have to be the best of the very best in taking down the deadliest of great ones. Enter the Orphan of Koss, best boss ever made. Well, that's that. The Big 60 has been squashed and every important boss from Dark Souls 2, 3, and Bloodborne have been listed. If you enjoyed these videos, please leave a dislike and subscribe to me so you can unsubscribe a second later. Or don't, none of this really matters anyways. But regardless, if you enjoyed or hated my list, I'm sure you'll let me know by creating your own list and making your own videos with the bosses. N no? You're too lazy to? I understand. And if you are lazy and don't care enough to go back and watch the other videos, feel free to enjoy the credits as I roll the top 60 on a word crawl. Still, even though these videos are over, I hope to bring you something new in the future, and maybe you can stop by then. For now, I'll take a break till I find the next thing to make videos for. Maybe I'll be back with Dark Souls or Demon Souls boss listings. Who knows? Who knows what the future may bring? But I'll save that for another time. <laughs> another time. Perhaps. Ah. Uh, sweet.
sweet child of Kos returned to the ocean. A bottomless curse, a bottomless sea, accepting of all that there is and can be. Ash seeketh ember. 